Hi, this is Jeff Mousseau with White Collar Advice, and we're here today with Justin Paperni. Uh, the reason we're here today is because this is a significant day for Justin. Uh, it was eight years ago today that Justin began his prison sentence. And so we're going to talk today about that first day um, and what it's like and what you can expect. Um, now, Justin, tell us, did you self-surrender? I did. I self-surrendered. My uh, my mom and brother drove me up I-5 into Bakersfield. I live in Los Angeles, and uh, I self-surrendered to Taft Federal Prison Camp the 28th of April at, um, in 2008. Uh, I was due to get there. I was My letter said get there at 2 o'clock. I got there several hours early at around 10 or 11 o'clock, and, uh, and my journey began, or continued, I should say. So did you uh, have a last meal on your way up? I did. I surrendered fat, bloated, and miserable, and angry, and we stopped at this Carl's Jr. as sort of my last meal, and I had this bacon double cheeseburger, and I was sick, and coffee, and I just, I didn't feel great. So, yeah. Well, what did you do to prepare? Uh, I didn't do much, as I've written about. I was in denial a bit, and uh, really unwilling to embrace the reality of the situation that I was going to jail, and uh, I had eight weeks to surrender, and prior to that, I was just so fixated on how I felt my life was coming apart, how I shouldn't have been prosecuted, it should have been handled civilly, not criminally, and so I purposely didn't prepare, knowing that would make matters worse. Uh, it would have been just too much work to sit down at a computer to read, to prepare, to study, whatever. So I went in uh, blind. Uh, someone in my family made one call to the prison to find out what I could surrender with. Um, said that I could come with shoes and, and a watch. So of course I went out, I bought the most expensive running watch and running shoes thinking that I could surrender uh, with, with them. Uh, but very little, very little preparations. Did you surrender directly to the camp itself? I surrendered, good question. I surrendered to the low security prison, which is adjacent to the, uh, which is adjacent to the camp. So you, you, to go to Taft, you go down this long dusty road and then you drive into the, you see this big, big, photo, big, big sign of, you know, Taft Correctional Complex, and you go down this dirt road, and you say that you see the barbed wire, the razor coil, and a huge track, and I was thinking like, wow, this is where I'm actually going to live, and I didn't even know, because I was so unprepared that eventually I'd be moved over to the satellite camp, but I surrendered and was checked in and processed at the low security prison. Okay, now that's, that's pretty standard for uh, surrendering to a camp. You go to uh, whatever higher facility is located adjacent to it and then uh, and that's where you surrender. Now what was it like to leave your family at that moment? It was uh, in retrospect I wish my brother would my older brother Todd would have just driven me. I didn't um, again I was still so caught up in my own mind I didn't fully consider the impact this was having on those that, that loved me. So my mom and brother actually walked in with me and as I walked in a little in La La Land, I said, I'm here to surrender. They asked me, the guard asked me for my registration number. I gave it to him. I got it at BOP.gov. Yeah. And um, I went out to shake his hand. And he gave me this okay. look. And yeah. he said, you know, we don't shake hands with inmates. And I looked over at my brother. And then I, I remember thinking like, wow, I'm in prison now. And I said to my brother, okay, it's time to get her out of here. I'd gone in with my wallet. I showed my ID to confirm that I was indeed Justin Matthew Paperni. But after I reached out to shake hands with the guard and he gave me a look and said, we don't speak with inmates, it was time for my family to go. It was time for me to make my world, make my way into the world of confinement. And frankly, it wasn't until I surrendered that I began to realize the impact that I had had on my family. In my case, I was 33, I didn't have children. I was frankly excited to get to jail, as crazy as that sounds, because I had been fighting my case for so long, three and a half years, the money, the lawyers, reputation, friends, the fallout. I was sort of like, just get me in to get this started. And I think had I had children or had been married at the time, I probably would have felt a little differently. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I am married, stayed married. Um, I have two children and uh, driving, or just backing out of the the driveway and watching my two boys standing in the window looking at me was, uh, you know, as indelibly etched in my mind. Yeah, um, I, it, it, it makes me sad to think of, but 
Um, you know, it was uh, like you said, you want to get there not because you're excited about the experience, but you just want to get that last phase over with. Um, can you describe uh, for somebody who's curious what the surrender process is? What actually happens once people have left and you're now alone? Sure. So, you know, in my mind, it was a big deal. Here I am surrendering to prison, presumably for the only time. And I, for the last, you know, three, four days before my surrender, I had this countdown in my mind, 96 hours, 72 hours, 24 hours, I'm going to be in prison. It's so surreal. And then when I surrendered, it was like no big deal to them. It was like no big deal to staff nonchalantly walking by. And I'm like, hello, I'm 33. I'm in jail. Like, what's yeah. up? And for them, I, I now know because they're so desensitized to it. They've seen so many of us come and go. It was like nothing. For me, it was, I don't want to say traumatic, but once I crossed over into prison boundaries, like this switch went off and I said, um, I'm not really prepared, but I'm going to work hard. This is going to be an opportunity of a lifetime. And I remember telling myself as I was going through the orientation or the ad admission process, they're asking about my state of mind, um, any health issues. I remember telling myself, I no longer wanted to be a contradiction. I don't want to get philosophical here, but for so long I had made promises to my family and friends about I'm going to lose the weight and I'm going to be great and you know this I'm going to just all these promises and I was like I never I never did it right I was like 30 40 pounds heavier when I surrendered and I, they loved me but I'm not sure they believed me so even on that first day in prison in fact even for like 90 minutes I waited before I went through this orientation 90 minutes in a holding cell I'm like all right. I started doing some push-ups and I'm like wow. 10 push-ups, 20 push-ups. I hadn't done them for years. So <laughs> even that first couple of hours, I began to get some confidence like this will be the opportunity of, of a lifetime. And I began to change my mindset. So when I went through the orientation, I, I embraced it. When I waited for two hours and I did a strip search and I had to squat and cough, I wasn't mad like, oh, this is degrading or dehumanizing. I was like, you know what? It's part of the journey. Uh, someday this is going to be behind me. Let's just uh, get through it, keep your mouth shut, and move on. And that switch really happened for me as my family drove away and as I made my way deeper into that first day of prison. You mentioned you were uh, you were strip searched. Um, that's kind of a insulting, dehumanizing thing, but I'm sure you had the same uh, feeling that I did, that I, I can't believe I'm looking at another human being who has to do this for a job. I wasn't um, even, yeah, that, that I was more thinking that I was actually glad that I was there. I tried to stay really positive. I said, this might be the only time I do this. And I had already gotten over a little bit of the frustration. I did surrender with shoes and, and a watch and because, you know, I was under the impression that I could bring it and they very quickly <laughs> and uh, quietly, you know, took it away. And I felt to a degree like I'd been a little exploited. I wrote in my book, I said, they, I felt like I'd been artfully robbed <laughs> of my shoes. It's like, I don't know, where is it? Is it like in the correctional officer's union or something? Where did they go? But I'm like, I suddenly was like, you know, it's all good. I had a few hundred dollars. They immediately brought on my, put on my books. Um, you know, I was in, I knew I was going to be, I was just anxious to get to the camp. Um, how, how did you physically get to the camp from where you surrendered? And like, you know, what was the uh, logistics there? So I was only in handcuffs once throughout this whole ordeal when I went through the yard of the low and I made my way to another building. I guess I was in handcuffs for my own protection, made my way to another building, went through a final sort of orientation process, questions, a little bit about my mental uh, you know, state of mind, emotional, any injuries or physical conditions. So I had, I filled out some forms. So after I went through this two or three hour orientation, much of which was waiting in a holding cell, um, I was driven in a van from the low security prison over to the camp and was taken into good old camp control, which is like the hub of the, the compound. Right behind it is, is the visitation room that's also used as an education room. So after about three hours, it uh, around 1.30, 2 o'clock-ish, I was over at the minimum security camp and was in awe of what I saw. What were you given by the BOP um, in terms of clothes, toiletries, anything like that, bedding? Sure. So I was, all of my clothes were taken and I was given, you know, prison garbs with, uh, if that's the right word, garbs, the pair of red or blues, you know, can, vans, canvas, slip-on type shoes. So when you hit the compound, everyone knows that you're the new prisoner because everyone's right. either in khakis, uh, their pants, the white tees. You walk on, they see your shoes, they see your outfit. Everyone knows the new prisoner 
is there. And I'm, you know, everyone's been through it, but I remember standing yeah. out in these clothes and it took about an hour or two. In fact, after the first 4 p.m. census count, um, I was taken to the laundry and given a jacket, a couple of pair of pants, some boxers, some socks, a pair of work boots, um, some sheets. Uh, I was on the upper bunk. I was in a cubicle. So I was, um, you know, given necessities or items fairly quickly. Uh, and I just began to sort of study and wonder the people with whom I'd be serving time for, from the second I saw them. Now, I went to, uh, I was at Lompoc, uh-huh. which is a federal facility. Um, and uh, like you, uh, I was initially provided with um, drawstring uh, trousers mm-hmm. and a t-shirt um, and, you know, those slip-on shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, you know, just like you described, it was a, a uh, an outfit that was unique to people that who had just arrived. And, yep. and you're only in that outfit for maybe a couple of hours before you're provided with something from the BOP. Right. Um, I uh, I was taken to the laundry. I was provided with a pair of pants that were about six inches too short. Yeah. Um, I was provided with a pair of boots that didn't fit. Mm-hmm. Um, I was provided with um, a couple of pairs of socks, a couple of pairs of boxers, um, a couple of pairs of t-shirts, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I I was given a sheet and a pillow. Right. No so that, blanket, yeah. no jacket, no nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, I surrendered, uh, you know, at a similar time period uh, as you did in April. And it was freezing cold. And I found out later that this was um, the type of thing that was done for white collar offenders, um, that you were treated that way, uh, treated harshly um, and provided with, uh, you know, that kind of apparel. Um, as a way to make sure that you understood right away that you were an inmate, uh, that there was no question. Um, and it took uh, probably two days before I had uh, a jacket who, that was provided uh, to me by another inmate um, and by, uh, you know, and other, other people uh, in the community among the inmates who provided me with a blanket who provided me with a, with pants and things like that now were you provided with toothbrush razor things like that no you, you'll learn from the first moment so you I hit the compound the, the guard tells me what dorm I'm in and from my first impression was it looked kind of like a corporate office park four dorms the track off to the left um, you know the commissary the barber shop the visiting room and camp control it, uh, it looked like a corporate office park, and I just saw hundreds of guys walking, and I realized after, I didn't know what they gave me was a little or a lot. It was my first experience, so that I figured mm-hmm. I had the necessities. And from the first couple of, I want to say first few minutes, guys were welcoming of me. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm always careful about giving unsolicited advice. Many people in prison do not have that problem. They were telling me, hey, dude, it's going to be good. How long are you here for? What's your story? Why are you here? Right. What happened? You're in a good dorm. You're just all these people throwing things at me. But there were some guys who uh, wanted to give me a few things, sort of a welcoming committee and embracing the pain it forward mantra. And there were some guys yep. who yep. walked me over to um, the, the chapel and there was a little gift basket for new prisoners. It was a little toothbrush and some toothpaste, some slippers uh, to shower. And all they said, well, I said, I don't have anything to give you. And they said, hey, just pay it forward. Someday when you're leaving yeah. and you're going home, you want to put a few things back in here for the new guys, yeah. that would be great. So pretty early, guys were welcoming of me, offering me some things. And I was very appreciative of that. And uh, I'll never forget I'll never forget the kindness. And indeed, towards yeah. the end of my journey, I repaid it um, in a way that others had paid it forward to me. Um, what was your first impression for people that are, are heading in uh, of things like the facilities, the the uh, eating facilities, the the bunk, the shower, the toilet, um, and things like sounds and smells. Sure. Can you give uh, somebody an idea? My first impression was the the community was much smaller than I thought. Right, it really is indeed like a community or a satellite type process. It's very small, and I liked how close I was to everything. I could see the library and the track. So my first impression was it's really a close knit community and group and I saw hundreds of guys walking there were 500 guys at at Taft camp 
my impression when I walked in the dorm was I was pleasantly surprised. Um, I like the cubicles. I was fortunate, I think, to be at Taft that has cubicles rather than pods. Or I know at Lompoc you were in a big, huge room and you had very little separation. So I liked that I had some privacy in the cubicle. Uh, I thought the bathrooms were cleaner than I had expected. I was a little curious why I saw some guys were taking showers, like lining up on one row, and I didn't understand some of the prison rules and until later on in my journey. But I did a lot of studying and watching, but my overall impression was it looked like a corporate office park. It was uh, much better than I had envisioned. Some of the whistling and the noises and the smells and things, Some there was some impolite activity, but it was it was all good. I didn't really care all that much. It was yeah. better than I had expected. Um, can you tell us, uh, do you remember your first meal? I remember my first meal that evening. They were serving um, hamburgers, and I was uh, not that hungry because of my last meal. <laughs> but I remember waiting in line. I still had my prison uniform on, and um, some guys were welcoming of me and just giving me advice and a lot of questions how long I was there for. I was kind of obsessed with how long people were there for or what their crimes were and what their situation was. I was almost fascinated with it. And um, even that first day, I was a little Jekyll and Hyde. I'd ask questions of people and want to learn. Then a few minutes later, I was like, I should keep my mouth shut. I should study more than I should talk. I should understand my environment. Then a few minutes later, I'd be conversing with someone. From that first day, a little Jekyll and Hyde, a little a little moody. And I did that because it was a long wait to get into the chow hall that first night. And sometimes they let the dorms out one by one. I guess that night they opened up all four dorms at once. So there was this crazy line. So there I am standing there as the new prisoner, still full for my last meal, um, nervous in this new environment, waiting to go in. And it was a buffet type uh, approach and there were hamburgers and some sort of watered down vegetables and cake, which I didn't eat. And I grabbed it and I sat down and Noticed there were some sections that ate together. The African-Americans were sitting together. Hispanics were sitting together. And others were, you know, scattered throughout the whole, um, you know, chow hall. And I had that first meal and sat with a few guys and um, was fairly quiet, did a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. It was done about 6 o'clock. And then I worked my way to um, the library for a few minutes, was impressed by the selection of books. And uh, I wrote my first letter home to let them know that I was there. Uh, that I was there safely, and I, I, I'd set a goal of getting my first letter in the mail that day. It's so important um, to an, for a new uh, inmate, and that is the counts. Mm-hmm. Um, did you know about it, and uh, were the other in- inmates helpful? Um, I'll tell you, I, I learned about the counts, counts from someone who turned out to be a very close friend of mine, a gentleman named Andrew Alchek, who unfortunately passed away in prison. Um, he was a white collar offender. We had the same judge, Judge Wilson. Andrew was serving, I think, a six year prison term. Um, and Andrew called me aside and said, Hey, this can be an incredible experience for you. And uh, I run. If you want to get into running, I'm looking for a partner. My routine is pretty strict. And I was like, I'd, I'd love to run. I haven't run in, since I was a baseball player in college. I'm out of shape. This is a great opportunity mm-hmm. for me. So that was probably around 2 30 that first day. And it was Andrew that told me. Uh, hey, there's a 4 p.m. census count every day, and they happen at 10:30, and they're going to close the compound and make sure that you're in your your the cube cubicle as it's called before that happens, and they're going to count and don't talk and uh, don't leave yeah. until they clear the count. And I was like, hey, I can totally do that. And then about 45 minutes later, I actually heard for the first time, attention campers, the compound is now closed. You know, report back yeah. to your designated housing unit. And I'm like, wow, I'm about to be counted in federal yeah. prison. For the first time and it was surreal so andrew gave me that advice he also told me by the way to be insouciant which was the first big word i learned in federal prison for those who don't know what it means i didn't know either i had to go to the library and look at it look it up but insouciance is a good way to serve your time through prison and beyond i wish i had been more insouciant as crazy as that word sounds he shared that word with me i looked it up and i tried my best uh, tried my best to be well, I hope that the people watching this will do the same and look up insouciant so they have an understanding <laughs> of what you're talking about now. So, Justin, before we wrap up, um, your first day, uh, very important, it sets the stage in a lot of ways for the rest of your time. Mm-hmm. And was there anything else that you wanted to add about uh, anything that happened to you on that first day that really set the stage for you? Sure. Well, after you get through the orientation, which... Um, you know, getting through the orientation, getting to the camp, eating, you know, seeing the surroundings, you begin to get adjusted. 
Uh, I regretted some of the conversations I had early on. I've talked about that in, in some of my other work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I knew that yeah. from that first day that it could be a productive experience or it could be an awful experience. And I had some breaks. Even though I didn't prepare, some people began to give me advice and they wanted to help me and I accepted the right advice. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the gentleman who had the greatest influence throughout my journey, uh, who of course is Michael Santos. And from that first day, right. you know, he came up to me and said, hey bud, what are you, what are you doing? What was your background? I said, I'm a broker. And uh, from that first day, Michael took me under his wing and began to give me some advice. And from our very first conversation with Michael, I said, dude, it's just so overwhelming all I have to do. You know, I'm in jail, separated from my family, I'm broke, I've lost my licenses, my reputation is destroyed, I'm fat. Like, how do you rebuild, man? Like, how do you do it? I'm telling you, Jeff, from that first day, from that first conversation, I think, you know, Michael's a writer and an interviewer, so he has the ability to elicit information. I said, it's just so overwhelming all that I have to do. And what changed my life and what changed that first day in prison is when Michael Santo said to me, Hey, bud, slow and steady wins the race. Are you familiar with tortoise and the hare? And I'm like, I got all check giving me words like insouciant that I don't understand. And how I have Santos telling me to read, read Aesop's fables about tortoise and the hare. But the point was, and what he ingrained in me that first day and what I did every day from my that first day in prison to the second day and beyond was make some progress every day. From that right. first night, I began to jog around the track despite the boots. Yeah. I couldn't lose 40 pounds in one night, but I could run a couple of miles. I couldn't write a right. book in one night, but I could write a letter home that day. Um, I had done so much to hurt my family. I made my first call home that night. And I said, Mom, I love you. I made some bad decisions. I'm here. I'm safe. It's going to be an incredible opportunity. Just watch. So I embraced the slow and steady wins, the race from that very first day. And I didn't repair my reputation. And one day I write a book or lose weight or reconnect with my family. I just did small little things every day, and I'm so grateful to Andrew Alchek. I'm so grateful to Michael Santos from that very first day in prison of giving me advice that I implemented, and it changed my life. So if someone is watching this and they're going to jail, find right. that mentor. Find someone right. that you can trust. Ask tough questions, and I pray and hope that all of you who will endure time in prison um, have a productive experience from that first day all the way to the end. And I'll close with what you do that first day indeed sets the tone for the whole journey. And I made a right. lot of stupid decisions, but I'm so grateful that I had mentors that gave me advice. Slow and steady wins the race. Justin, thank you for sharing. Thanks, bud, very much. I appreciate you uh, suggesting we do this interview on my uh, eight-year uh, eight anniversary of going to jail. Thanks very much.